Well, again, what a privilege it is, what an honor it is to gather together like this. We don't take it for granted. There was a time when it was not allowed, according to the government, and it precipitated some tremendous controversy within our nation as to what was essential and not essential. And we at Church at the Center began to travel down this pathway of worshiping outside in our cars. And so we recognized that there was a need for us to gather collectively. And here we are, some years later, still worshiping not only in that manner, but we provide opportunity insight as well. May we never take it for granted. You know, I think that the, the great tendency in that which we are going to don't think, I recognize that the great tendency of the church and of nations in the past is now to go back to sleep. When there is a time of desperation, we see church attendance increase. It's almost like foxhole religion, where many, many soldiers prior to a battle may actually pray to God and promise him to serve him the rest of their lives simply because they're frightened of the battle. And we see that in the nation as well, that often when there's crisis, church attendance historically tells us uh, goes up. History tells us goes up. And then once, once the crisis is diminished or has passed, then the people go back to what was in reality the natural state of their relationship with God to start with. And I pray that that will not be the case at church at the center. I pray that our attendance will not drop off. I pray that our allegiance and our uh, our surrender to the will of God and his purposes, including worship, will not diminish simply because now, again, as some have promised, the golden age of the United States has returned. I would be quick to remind you that the hearts of the individuals in our nation were not changed as a result of the election. And some of the atrocities that I have witnessed, and even this past week, that I personally been uh, exposed to are an indication as to the spiritual life of our nation. We are still in very critical condition, ladies and gentlemen, and there is a long ways to go. So let us be diligent in our service of the Lord. Can you say that? And let us not neglect the gathering together. Well, today we are going to look at the second Sunday of Advent, the emphasis of the second Sunday of Advent, and that is the Sunday of Peace. Often some churches will light a second candle on this Sunday, and it's called the Candle of Bethlehem, or the Bethlehem Candle. And it is reminding us of the journey of Joseph and Mary. And this is called the Sunday of Peace. Today we're going to read a scripture that does have a reference to peace in it. And we are going to look at the path by which peace arrived. The past path by which peace arrived. The coming of peace was a strong stream within the prophecies, a strong subject stream within the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning the coming of the Messiah, who we now know is Jesus the Christ. And that prophetic stream often mentioned the element of peace, the initiation and the establishment of peace. And this sounds wonderful. And on the surface, it sounds very simple. It sounds like something that should be, by a supernatural power, easy to implement. But in reality and in practical knowledge and in the story revealed to us within the scriptures, it proved to be quite otherwise. But let us go back, if we may to today, to Luke, the second chapter, very familiar group of scripture, probably one of the most familiar scriptures in connection with this season that we call Christmas. Let's go to Luke, the second chapter. I'm going to begin reading with verse 1, but our verse 4, our reference is going to be verse 14. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius, Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David, which, by the way, was a fulfillment of prophecy. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him 
and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. <clears throat> and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. That all sounds so romantic, doesn't it? But how many of you have walked through a cow pasture? And how many of you have been around a lot of sheep? It was not at times a very pleasant place to be. And you had to watch where you're walking. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. You would have been too. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be to all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ. That is the Greek word for Messiah. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel. We don't know how they did. We don't know whether they were standing on earth or as many artists have pictured, they were up in the air, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rest. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. We're going to focus upon that 14th verse, which said, Glory to God in the highest heaven. The Bible records there are three heavens, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verse 6, speaks, as we read this morning in our Sunday school lesson, is a perf one of the strongest, greatest, most concise prophecies regarding the coming of the Christ. And it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. If there's anything the world needs today, it is peace. As you, as, as you and I sit here today in relative peace, we would perhaps be astonished to know that the re most recent study by the group that keeps track of active conflicts around the world since the close of World War II, this has been in place, 1946 is when this record-keeping began, has told us that in the last six months of 2024, there are more conflicts and active wars raging around the world than in the history of record-keeping since 1946. There will be, the Bible says, prior to, immediately prior to, the climatic return of Jesus Christ to this earth in power, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And that's where we're at. And we are finding that not only on a national level, but we find it in a societal level. The amount of violence and the amount of, of lack of peace and turmoil. And then on an individual level, more people, more young people, astonishing children down to elementary school are revealing their anguish, their lack of peace, their depression, their discouragement. We live in a time in which people do not have peace. We are seeking to increase throughout, I can tell you, the state of Ohio. The number of beds that are available 
to those who need mental help and need mental treatment because it is skyrocketing. Truly, this is an age of turmoil. And the promise of the scripture was that there was one coming who would bring peace. And we're so grateful for that and how much we need that. But we need to recognize that we have often glorified, perhaps, the story of the first Christmas. But we need to recognize that the peace that was foretold was much different than perhaps what we think and the pathway by which that peace arrived, although a tremendous honor, proved to be costly. The pathway by which peace we can experience today through the grace and presence of Jesus Christ was tremendously costly to him and is still costly today. And the pathway to future peace, in which peace is going to finally be established worldwide, and the lion will lay down with the lamb, and we will experience a peace, literal manifested peace in this world, inwardly and outwardly, such as has not been here and present since the Garden of Eden. And that will, however, the pathway to that peace is going to be a pathway that is unexpected by many. We often glamorize Christmas. I said this last week. And one of the difficulties of speaking and preaching during this time of the year is not because we don't like the subject or I don't enjoy preaching about the coming of the Christ. I really enjoy that. But it's the difficulty of arresting people's attention and shaking them out of the, of the nostalgic realm of I'm dreaming of a white Christmas and bringing us into the reality, although there's nothing wrong with that, I like that song. I play it at home. But what, what our business is here is to bring as much reality of what took place then and what the conditions are now as we can to help us to live a life that is ready to experience the victory of Christ in the very real world we live in. So today we need to focus upon the journey. That's what I'd like us to do for the next few moments, next few minutes. Let's focus on the journey of obedience of the little maiden named Mary. Some believe, some Bible scholars, believe that she might have been 14 years old, as young as 14, when the angel appeared to her and gave her this startling, earth-shaking, her world-shaking revelation. And then her husband Joseph, who also may have very well been a teenager at the time. Let's look at the pathway by which this peace arrived. This Prince of Peace and the angel announced to Mary, we did not read that, that she was going to carry this Prince of Peace. And let us recognize, and hopefully it'll help us, as we seek to follow and partner in this what C.S. Lewis respectfully and reverently called the dance between man and God. C.S. Lewis said that this strange cooperation between man's will, between man's will not only as a society, perhaps as a people group, perhaps as a nation, or perhaps as smaller groups or a family, but, but usually boils it down to an individual, this dance between the individual and Almighty God. There's a dance that goes on. You, you are, are, whether you like it or not, God is seeking to move into the life and the consciousness of every individual. And there he would love to initiate a dance between you and himself that would result in the most beautiful life and fulfillment and relationship and fellowship and satisfaction that you could ever experience. So let's look at their perspective, and I'm going to give you some points that you may not have thought of, and one is a point in general that is applicable to both Mary and Joseph and to us. First of all, what is exciting to God? Let us recognize that what is exciting to God may not seem so to us. What God thinks is exciting may not be exciting to you. And it is almost impossible for us to comprehend the setting in which Mary received the assignment to carry the Son of God within her. 
And there are examples within the Bible. I mean, we cannot, we cannot understand the way her mind was racing, I'm sure, the questions that were arising, the, the speed of her heartbeat and respiration, the, at, the, at not only the appearance of a, of a supernatural being in front of her, but the message that he gave to her was mind-boggling. We can't understand that. Now, we also can't understand it in light of the fact, as we will bring out, the context of the society that she lived in. What the angel told her that she was going to participate in was against the law of Moses, so to speak. And it was, it was an incredible pathway for which God came to save the world. Sometimes the pathway that God has used, and we find this often in the Bible and in sometimes in our own history as a nation, the pathway that God chooses, the individuals, this participation, this dance that God chooses to, to initiate between those of his followers and him, whereby to bring about his will through them and in them, is not always seen as exciting. And it is a forewarning to you and I that God's will, although it is the best, God's will is the supreme, supreme best for you and I. It may not always appear to be exciting to you. In fact, it may be terrifying. In fact, it may seem like a weight heavier than you can bear. We find that that is not something that is isolated to us. It is something that we see exemplified in the Bible. We think of Moses and the, the nation of Israel. Moses is the greatest of all the prophets, the greatest of all the leaders. And God appeared to Moses, as many of you know the story in Exodus, the third chapter. And God tells Moses out on, uh, through a burning bush, a bush that is on fire, draws attention, Moses' attention. Moses goes over to it, and lo and behold, a voice begins to speak out of that bush. I mean, that is astonishing in itself. We could spend a whole service on that, a whole sermon on that, probably a series of sermons. God begins to speak to him and, and out in the backside of the desert. And God tells Moses, I have seen the suffering of my people, the people you were caring about, the people you do care about. I've seen their suffering. Here's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do something miraculous. And then in verse 10, he does something. He takes a right turn which Moses did not expect. And he says, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now listen, again, we don't have time to drill down here, but all you have to do is use your imagination a little bit that here is a shepherd who's been out in the fields for 40 years away from the power of Egypt. He knows the power of Egypt. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. He knows what God is saying. He knows the power that it's going to take. He knows the military. He knows the might. He knows the wealth. He knows all about it. He ran from there, and God just simply almost casually says to him, and so now, go. I'm sending you. Now, the reaction of Moses is to begin to moonwalk. How will I know? What will I tell them your name is? I mean, this is astonishing. So God is very patient with him. God tells him to throw his staff down on the ground. God gives him sign after sign. And we find that Moses, recognizing the burden that's going to be placed upon him, still does not find this exciting. Remember, what is exciting to God may not seem so to you. And Moses finds this less than exciting. And he says in verse 13, but Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. And at that point, God was fed up. It says the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he began to talk to him about Aaron. And he appointed Aaron to be his mouth. What that was not his original plan. Gideon, another example. Gideon is in is threshing wheat in a in a hidden area because of the Midianites that were oppressing the people. It was so real. People had been killed. They were under the oppressive thumb of the Midianites. And Gideon is out there trying to get some wheat 
thresh for his family so they can live. And an angel appears to him. The Lord ap appears to him. And he tells them that he, he is aware of the Midianites and he's seen the suffering of his people and he's going to save them. And that's all good news to Gideon and this young man. And then the Lord turns to him and says the same thing. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Now listen to the wording of that. Go in the strength you have. Just like, go in the strength you have and save. Now listen, he knew what that involved. He knew the magnitude of what was going to be involved. He knew the military warfare that was going to take place. And God almost casually, the Lord almost casually says to him, just go in the strength you have and save my nation. That was exciting to God, but it wasn't exciting to Gideon. <clears throat> Gideon says almost the same words that Moses did. Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, trying to be reverently and reverent and respective. He said, but how can I save Israel? My family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord went on to say, I will be with you and will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. But we have modern day examples. George Washington, we see him as the father of our nation. He led our forces to be victorious eventually in Yorktown through many, many <clears throat> terrible days of suffering and battle, outnumbered and retreats, but miraculously and courageously led our nation to victory over the most powerful nation on earth, the Empire of England at that time. But they were going to nominate him as president. He knew that was coming. He didn't want it. And when the nomination came in January of 1789, George Washington said this, and I'm reading his words. My movements to the chair of government will be accompanied by feelings not unlike those of a culprit of an individual who is going to the place of his execution. So unwilling am I. Washington said, I feel like I'm going to be executed when I am sworn in to the office of president. I don't want it. He went on to say, I call heaven to witness that this very act would be the greatest sacrifice of my personal feelings and wishes that I have ever been called upon to make. He didn't want the job. But we recognize, and I believe you could recognize as well, God had his hand upon George Washington. And George Washington was going to carry the will of God but it was unexciting to him. It was even unpleasant. We have lived in a day, we have fostered such an element of entitlement and of security and of pleasure, a thirst for pleasure, that we never or ever seldom bring up in a role or in a, in a place like this. We seldom bring up anything to any congregation that would ever hint that there would be a sacrifice involved in serving God. Because we know that in the United States of America, that's a no-no. We love comfort. And do not, if you want to diminish the size of your crowd that you speak to on Sunday morning, just begin to tell them that God may ask them to do something unpleasant. We want to hear God's got a wonderful plan for my life and everything's going to be great, everything's going to be rosy, and if it isn't great, isn't rosy, something's wrong and we get mad at God. But I would remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that history is replete with example after example, both in the Bible and here. We could talk about Abraham Lincoln in 1860, prior to leaving Springfield, where he told his law partner in a quiet voice when they were saying goodbye and he was leaving the office, he said, leave the sign there at the bottom of the steps that announced his law firm. Lincoln and Herndon said, please leave it there. Let it hang there undisturbed. If I live, I'm coming back sometime. And we'll go right on practicing law as if nothing happened. Lincoln, it was almost as if he knew that he was not going to live. When he left on the special train that was to carry him to D.C. to try to protect him because of the numerous threats on his life and the plans had been uncovered by the Pinkertons, uh, that, that they were going to stop the train and assassinate him place after place, so much so that they had to route the train a, spe a special pathway to even get him to Washington, D.C. because the plan was to kill him before he even got there. 
Lincoln called those gathered, his friends and neighbors who had gathered to see him off in Springfield. He said, please, he said, to his care, commending you as I hope in your prayers, you will commend me. I bid you an affectionate farewell. And a reporter for Harper's Weekly recorded that the crowd that had gathered there in the softly uh, falling snow to see him go cried out with loud voices, we will pray for you. We will do it. We will do it. We look back through history and we know Lincoln was assassinated, but we may think that he was just filled with joy to assume that responsibility. We all recognize he was a man of the hour, that God had chosen him to bring our nation through. But where do we ever get the idea that lifting and following and carrying the will of God, carrying the purposes of God, will always be exciting? May not be. Perhaps you have an inward call. Perhaps God has laid some assignment on you. It may not be to be president of the United States, but it is an assignment. It may deal with your family. It may deal with you or some incident or something that God is speaking to you about. It may not be as enormous as Mary's or Moses, but it's definitely not exciting to you. It may even seem terrifying to you. I would encourage you not to dismiss it. I would encourage us all to recognize that sometimes what is exciting to God may not appear exciting to us. Secondly, in regards to caring or the pathway of God's peace for Mary and for us today, not everyone understands it or accepts it. God may call you to do something. God called Mary to do something. God lift, put upon her the weight of carrying the will of God, and Mary's yielding to carry God's will immediately cost her cost her immediately the loss of her reputation. The scandal, the rejection from society that she experienced, the rejection probably from her own family, from close friends who turned away from her, perhaps the laughing right in her face at the ridiculous nature of her explanation as to why she was not married and yet pregnant. She was walking alone with God for a short time until finally the angel through a dream convinced Joseph, her betrothed husband, and he came alongside of her. But ladies and gentlemen, let us recognize that this couple, this young couple, Mary and Joseph, uh, to the rest of the world, to their world, he was a fool and she was a liar. And that was the pathway by which God chose to send Peace, the pathway of peace to the majority of society. She would always be this. For unless her friends or her loved ones turn to become believers in Christ, her, re her excuse, her reason will always be ridiculous throughout the rest of her life. Others will always turn their head and whisper in each other's ear for the rest of her life. This was the price she paid for carrying the will of God, for carrying the Son of God, for carrying the salvation of the world, this young girl. And there may be occasions in our own life, ladies and gentlemen, when his plan for us, his plan for you, may be cause for misunderstanding, even rejection, by those around you, by those you are closest to. Jesus knew that. Jesus told us in Luke 6, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, when they reject your name as evil, when they don't invite you to the party, when they don't invite you out to the dinner, because, why? Because of the Son of Man. Because you're affiliated with me. Because you're carrying my will. Because you choose to follow me. How dare you choose to follow Jesus Christ in 2024? How dare you? Because if you do, might, not, might, not everyone may accept it. Number three, your identity changes. Mary and Joseph's life, as we just said, will never be the same. They would be viewed differently from this point forward. 
who they were was fundamentally connected to their assignment and their following of God. I, I believe that we have preached such a weak message that we have given false hope to individuals that they are truly in the kingdom of heaven when we have not been honest with them and said this thing of becoming a Christian, this thing of accepting Christ, this thing of asking Christ to forgive us and to come in and renovate our life and truly be called a born again, so much so that we're born again, is not as simple and is not as easy as we've made out to be. It is wonderful. It is wonderful beyond comparison. It's wonderful beyond degree. I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have him. I'd rather have his fellowship. It is something that happens inside of your heart that is so real that it is difficult to put into language. Thousands of poets, thousands of songwriters, even those inspired in the scripture have difficulty revealing the reality, the beauty, the power, the relationship that we can have with the living Christ. This baby is not a stranger to us. This baby who became a man, who's, who died on a cross, rose from the dead, is not just a historical figure. He is actually living within us. He is actually, he is actually with us and in us. But ladies and gentlemen, there is a price. There is a cost. Christianity has never been popular down through the ages, and it never will be. There are people who don't want to hear it. There are people I'm preaching to right now that I'm speaking to, you don't want to hear it. You're doing your best to ignore it. Why? Because it is light versus darkness. It is life versus death. It's because it is that sword that Jesus came to bring. And it is through that sword that peace comes to an individual and to a world. But there is a price to pay. Our identity changes. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian. Some people get it. I've preached long enough, over almost... 1978, I started preaching to 19 or 2024. I've preached long enough, I can tell you hundreds of times of people that I saw come right up, right up, peering into the window of the, peering into the window, looking in the window, listening, watching, looking, and then they finally get it. And they say, huh? Sorry, that, nah, sorry, that, nah. <laughs> it's for some people. That's good, that's cool, that's cool, it's for you. If that's what you want, that's cool. But it's not for me, why? Because they get it. They understand that this thing is going to require a change of my identity. When you carry Christ within you, Christ said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Ladies and gentlemen, that isn't subtle. That's right in your face. That's saying if you truly belong to this one Christ who shook the world up and they eventually hung him on a tree and killed him, if you belong to him, don't think you're going to be able to finesse your way through and no one know that you have this earth mover living in your heart. That is impossible. You can't be undercover. You're not in the secret service. This is full dress uniform. Everyone will know it. You don't have to go around blowing a trumpet. You don't have to go around announcing it to everyone. It'll come out. You live for Christ, you speak up for him, it will come out, and they will know you by that. That's how you'll be known. You could be other things. I'm known by this title, I'm known by that title, I'm known by this title, but primarily, primarily, I will tell you, I'm known as a preacher. What? 
Now, I'm not ashamed of that, but I can tell you that definitely has a cooling effect on a lot of conversations when that comes up. I tell you what, man, I have seen more people begin to... You probably don't remember Jackie Gleason and the Honeymooners, but he would have a Ralph Cramden moment. Amina, 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 amina. And I've seen more people just lose their train of thought. I've actually seen people have to light up a cigarette and calm themselves. Why? If this thing, this thing of, of, it isn't because I'm a preacher, it's because what a preacher represents. I'm talking about hopefully the good things. that are, A preacher represents Jesus and God and we don't, I mean, we don't say those things out loud. And I'm known for that. You will be many things in your life. You may hold many titles, wonderful titles, excellent. You may be gifted in many areas. You may be looked upon as a leader in this world and in society. You may be esteemed. You may be respected. But if you truly, truly begin to carry the will of God, if you truly begin to live this thing and allow God to move through you and put his best life in you so that you become a vessel through which you can carry his will for not only yourself but those around you like Mary, your identity is going to change. Who you are, that will always be. Behind your back or in your face, that will always be who you are. I met a man this week who holds a, he's a commissioner, holds an office of commissioner, has for many years, when I was in meetings this week, and you can't be with that man five minutes without him beginning to talk about Route 30. That's what he's known for. Even when you talk to others, you mention this man's name, and they'll say, Route 30. That's his identity. He wants to finish Route 30. By the way, I'm in agreement. He wants to finish Route 30 from East Canton over to Route 11, make it four-lane highway. Wouldn't that be awesome? And that's his goal. You and I, in Christ, our identity is changed. Mary's identity was changed. Number four, it becomes more evident the longer you carry it. There was no hiding what happened to Mary. We have no evidence that she did try to hide it. In fact, she said, may it be unto me as you have said. And her soul rejoiced in the Lord. The Spirit of God spoke out of her and she said, I'm, I'm honored to be the Lord's handmaiden. But ladies and gentlemen, the more she carried, the longer she carried the plan of God for peace, the more evident it became. And the more you and I walk with God, the more you and I live for Him, the more you and I have the audacity to walk out and to live out loud Christ and His plan and will in our lives, the more it's going to become evident to those around us. You will not keep it a secret. It'll become more and more evident as you carry God's will. And we'll come out of the closet we, he will be enlarged within us. God wants to enlarge himself within you. God wants to become more in you and to you and through you. You should not be at the same place you were five years ago. There ought to be some kind of advancement. And there ought to be some type of growth. Mary grew. You and I need to grow. And, it will, and God is enlarged within us and it becomes more evident. Number five, you must carry it. Mary had to carry the plan of God. She had to yield to it. God implanted the baby within her, but Mary was responsible to carry him. Do you ever think about that? She had the responsibility to nourish and protect Jesus. She had to make sure that she kept and protected the plan and the presence of God within her. When we become carriers of God's will, we also, you and I, have a responsibility to nourish that, to nourish our relationship with Him, to nourish our call, to nourish God's will within us. How do we do that? How do we nourish that? Through the feeding of the Word, to our soul, through the water of the Spirit, through prayer, by listening to those who are called to help us come alongside that have walked this pathway, 
that have carried God's will to help you carry it, to help you carry the presence of God. The young maiden, I was thinking about this. Think about the fact that this young maiden, this young junior high girl, what a tremendous weight God put on her. But she was willing to grow up. She was willing to grow up. She was willing to pay the price. She was willing to be who God asked her to be. We live in a day today in which people are unwilling to grow up. We have a rash, we have an epidemic of Gen Xers and that refuse to get out of their parents' basement. Failure to launch. They don't want to grow up. They don't want to be adults. They want to play video games all the time. I'm just astonished. Their life, their world, they want their world to be some fictitious world. They don't want to face reality. And that has not just crept into the church, that is a pattern in the church where we have cultivated such a, a realm and an atmosphere of comfort that we can't get people to grow up in Jesus Christ. They will not grow up. They will not become adults. At least Mary was willing to grow up. She was willing to take on the burden and the will of God. We have men who, who are grown men in body, but they won't grow up. We have women, some, some grandmother age, who will not grow up. Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, was frustrated in the book of Hebrews. He told the Hebrews, he said, you ought to be teachers, and instead, you still need to be taught basic principles. He said, you ought to be on meat, and instead, I'm still having to feed you milk. Other churches in America are filled with people that the pastor has to pull out the bottles every Sunday and give them milk because they regurgitate anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to be, if the church is going to be, if America is going to receive the revival we need, we are going to have to grow up, put some teeth in, and begin to chew on some milk and accept the call of God in our life and be willing to simply be called Christians even though they may spit it out of their mouth in your face. There are labor pains. <laughs> Mary endured labor pains. The moment God started it, he said, it's time. But she had to participate. There's that dance. She had to push. She couldn't give up. She couldn't stop. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Her labor was required to bring forth the will of God. Think about that. Her labor. Her effort, her pushing, her straining, her sweat, maybe even her screaming, was required to bring about the plan of God to save the world. The physical effort of a young girl was required to bring about our salvation. Now, God only did that once. <laughs> but you and I should not be surprised. Help us to remember, Lord. Help us to remember, Lord, that when we're on your pathway and things get tough and things get hard and it's just really getting tough and you're having a hard time, your, your energy is leaving, your strength is leaving, and yet, it isn't done yet. And you come to church or you talk to someone or you read the Bible and they just, all they can say to you is just keep pushing. That's not very encouraging. But let me tell you, that's the key. We are responsible so that we don't lose the will, the baby, the plan, the purpose of God in our lives. Even your walk with Christ, when it gets the toughest, there's some reason, there's some reason it gets tough. And I think that's because the enemy sees what you can't see. And the enemy knows 
that the victory is right there. The devil knows you are on the brink of something wonderful. And so many people give up. Oh, I've seen it. They give up. They leave. They've left here. I watched God's progress in their life. I watched God moving in their life. I've prayed for them nightly. I see God moving, and all of a sudden, they're gone. Oh, but you don't know how hard it got. Oh, pastor, you just don't know how hard. They quit. They quit pushing because there was labor. Ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit is your holy midwife right with you. Christ said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He is our comforter. That's his name. And when we are in a time when it seems as if even the deep yearnings of your heart are known to God. There have been times in my life when I could not articulate words to express what I was feeling, the depth of where I was at. I just was thinking, oh God, oh God, oh God, you know my heart. You know my heart, oh God. You know where I'm at. You know what I want. And God hears that. And God hears you. Don't give up when the labor pains come. Why? Because lastly, there's joy in the end. There is joy in the end. Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. Hold on. Hold on, my child. Joy will come. Listen, when that baby is born, when Mary gave birth to that promised baby, yes, all the promises of mankind were wrapped up in that little however many pound boy. But I guarantee you that when that final last push and that baby popped out <laughs> and they cut the cord and they laid that little crying thing up in her lap, up in her arms, mm -hmm. no one had more joy than Mary. No one had joy filling her heart like the one who had carried the baby, the one who had lifted the weight, the one who had gone the whole way. God has chosen you and me to carry something maybe more than one thing in our lifetime. He's chosen us. I guarantee you, you walk with Christ, he'll call you. And he'll want to lay some call to carry on you for something. I want to encourage you, all of these things that Mary experienced, we will experience. Carry it. You see, Joy is coming. Mary had joy. There was still more sorrow. There was still more pain. It was a season of joy. But God has promised us that the byproduct of the Holy Spirit within us is joy. Yet while we're still in this world, we can have joy. But I want to remind you that the ultimate joy that we can have is to be found in the future. This isn't the only world you're ever going to live in. Matthew 25, 23, Jesus said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Jesus, it says in Philippians, for the joy set before him endured the cross. There's a joy coming. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, there's a joy coming to those who will carry the will of God and carry the relationship of Christ all the way to the end. Perhaps you're here tonight, or this morning rather, and I know I preached a long time, but it isn't night yet. Perhaps you're here and you say, I've missed it. I can think back on some things that I should have, would have, could have done, and I've missed it. I've got good news for you. You're still alive. You're still breathing air. If you're still walking with Christ, if you still have a relationship with you, 
he still has something for you to carry. I was particularly, I almost, almost focused the whole message around a verse I didn't use. And it was found, <clears throat> I believe in Luke, where the angel is talking to Mary and he says, it's in Luke 136. He's telling Mary that what he's telling her is true. And he said this to prove it, even Elizabeth, your relative, in her old age, is going to have a baby. Even Elizabeth, even Elizabeth, in her old age, is going to have a baby. If you're thinking, I'm too old today, this is for young people. No, even Elizabeth. I want you to remember that as you leave here. Even Elizabeth, in her old age, is going to have a baby. You and I should all be pregnant with the will of God and bring it forth to great joy. Let's pray. Father, I am aware that only those that can receive this message have received it. I am aware that as difficult, as, as hard as I've tried to articulate this, not everyone has been able to receive it. Some have chosen not to receive it. But I know that you caused me to preach this for those who know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe they're in a situation in their life right now. It's gotten hard, hard, hard. Maybe it's been hard for a long time. They're in a long battle. It almost seems like a siege. And they're tired. They're tired of pushing. I want, oh God, them to be encouraged. I want them, oh God, to know they're not alone. I want them to know they're walking the pathway that the saints have trodden before them. They're walking the pathway that those whose names they would recognize walk before them. Oh God, as they leave this place, as they leave this place, may more than Tim Ginner's words be in their heart. As they leave this place, may just one person, one person, leave this place feeling and sensing the Spirit of God, the voice of God. God has spoken to me. This was for me. These words were for me. I had almost given up hope to see victory in the land of the living. But, oh God, if we will carry, you will assist us, and we will bring forth, and there will be joy in the end. May, oh God, the legacy of all who are here today, someday as we gather over on the other side, in that other dimension that is called eternity, may, oh God, we be able to rejoice with joy because we were found faithful to endure all that it took to bring about the dance. We finished the dance. We finished the dance. And God said, well done. Well done. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you.